before from your Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> That's all right. Now, how many of you, now did anyone here go on the Black Friday shopping? You know, I was on uh, Facebook and someone said not yet. I was on Facebook and said, someone said, you know, I want to go Black Friday shopping, but I got to make sure I pay my electric bill first. Or else I have a Black Saturday and a Black Sunday. And so I hope none of y'all have a Black Saturday or a Black Sunday. Make sure you pay your bills first before you start going on Black Friday. Anyway, well, uh, good morning again, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. It's been such a while since I've been able to come on a Saturday morning and see all of your beautiful, wonderful, and amazing faces today. You all look beautiful, by the way. Do you believe that? Oh, you, all, you, don't, you don't believe that. I'll say it again. You all look beautiful. You don't believe that? All right. Sounds good. I'm glad you do. Well, let me kick things off by saying my name. For some of you, you may not know who I am. I see a few new faces that are here. And Robert, it's good to see you. Robert first came to Toledo first. And then when he came to Toledo first, we looked at his address and we figured that he was closer to Northwood. So we said, Robert, you're coming to Northwood now. So I'm glad that uh, Robert is here. And uh, some few uh, other faces that are new to me. Welcome, nice to meet you. What's your name, please? Anna, Anna, Angelita Fortner. All right, sounds good. Well, nice to see you finally. So that is good. Yes, yes, yes. I know your name, but I don't think we've met before. Beautiful. All right, and so I think everyone else said, yes, I've never met you before as well. What's your name, please? Yes, Susan Eisenbrand. All right, welcome, Susan. This is, uh, is this your first time here today? Or you've been here before? First time, all right, wonderful. Can we give a round of applause, everybody? That was fantastic. Uh, you're, so, you're so welcome. And uh, this is a Northwood. Uh, we are a loving family, and so we welcome you to the family and that uh, we hope that you journey with us for the long haul, all right? That is beautiful. That is awesome, that is awesome, that is awesome. All righty, and so anyway, um, my name is Kojo, by the way. You may not know who I am, so my, <laughs> my name is Kojo, and I am the pastor here, and I get to work with an awesome team, uh, and I'm so grateful for them. In my absence, they always take care of things very well. And so it's good to be here. So a couple of things I want to share, and then we've got a full service today. And so everyone strap your seatbelts on. Quite a lot that I'm going to be doing uh, this morning. Uh, so this morning, our message is called A Different Kind of Gratitude. You're going to be blessed by this message. It's going to actually be a very short message, about 10, 12 minutes. The message won't be long uh, because we have our beautiful communion service to participate in. Now, before I go ahead and preach this sermon, got a lot of things to do um, beforehand. First thing to do so that you all know is that I am traveling. So I'm going to be, I want you all to, I'm requesting for you all to pray for me. I'll be traveling to Ghana on Wednesday um, for a mission trip. I'll be gone from November 29th and I'll be back on December 11th. And so we just request your prayers. Uh, this is uh, the staff, but it's a whole team of 23 of us uh, that we're leading and that we're going along over there. And the goal is to preach the gospel to literally the entire country. And so uh, we're asking for God to really, really, really uh, touch people's hearts and lives. We're praying, our goal, we're praying that God will allow 10,000 lives to give their hearts to him. 10,000. So that's a pretty big uh, goal. And But we said, you know what, we're going to pray for a God-sized goal. And so we'll come back. Maybe it'll be 10,000, maybe it'll be 10. Whatever it is, we're grateful for what the Lord does. And so... That's the first thing. I want you all to pray for me as I go on this trip so I won't be available. But if there's anything you need, you can always contact any of our elders or you can contact our office and we can be able to help out with that. Second thing is that when I return, as soon as I return, uh, we will be having an awesome event. Now, uh, when I was talking to the team about this, I said the, the, the word blast may give people different reactions. But uh, I think that it's a positive reaction. Uh, because we had the wonderful summer blast that took place. And what we'll be having as soon as I get back uh, from Ghana is that we'll be having our winter blast. We'll be having a winter blast. And so it's going to be a fun time. Uh, there is, uh, first and foremost, it's going to be taking place from December 14 to December 16. So the way it'll work is that December 14 and 15, uh, it will happen at 6.30 p.m. in the evening time. That's a Thursday and a Friday. And then after that, December 16, it will conclude 11 a.m. in the morning time right here. 
And so it's going to be a full time of food, games, prizes, giveaways, kids fun, and also inspiring messages. And so what I'm going to be talking about each and every single time is I'm going to be talking about how to have a great 2024. And so you want to be able to come for that. I invite you to invite others to come for the Winter Blast. It will happen right here. So you see the address. It will happen right here in the church building. And uh, everyone is invited to be a part of this. And so just one. So this year we've had, we had summer blast in the summertime. Then from my other church, we had fall blast. And so now we're going to have winter blast. And y'all think spring, I don't know if spring blast going to come. I think I'm going to retire by then. So we're going to have winter blast uh, on December 14th to the 16th. So I wanted to let everybody know about that. And uh, you're welcome to be here for it. All right, sounds good. Now, I want to say one last thing about winter blast. So for those of you who have been a part of, who are a part of our church family, we would love for you to be involved in our winter blast. And so what I'm going to be passing out at the end of the entire service is that we've got a sheet of paper where you can sign up for different things to help out with Winter Blast uh, so that we can uh, really have an awesome time and an awesome event. All right. Now, the next thing I want to pause and do is that speaking about Summer Blast, uh, something I want to take my time and do at this moment. During Summer Blast, we had the awesome privilege of a lot of people uh, who uh, gave their hearts to Jesus and said they wanted to be baptized. Now, one thing that we do here in our church is that when people get baptized, uh, there is a baptism certificate that we typically give to them in order to kind of serve as a memento and a memorial of your baptism. So you take the certificate. I want you to frame it somewhere. Keep it safe. Don't lose it. It is yours. It confirms that you are baptized and it confirms the witnesses that are around you. And so at the moment, um, what I would like to do at this moment is that I would like to call up those who got baptized during the uh, summer blast and I've got your certificate here for you today. So we're going to call you up. You're going to come up. We're going to give the certificate to you. We're going to give you a round of applause in order to congratulate you. And so we're going to kick it off. I'm going to call you by name and you can come up and you can receive it. So the first person is Jennifer Kaufman. So Jennifer Kaufman, why don't you come on up? Why don't we give her a round of applause, everybody? Now, Jenny, this is for you. Jenny, uh, what's it called? She actually didn't get baptized. She had something called profession of faith. So that's why you get this one over here. And so God bless you, Jenny. And uh, Jenny, your, is it grandfather-in-law, right? So keep her in prayer. Her grandfather-in-law had a terrible accident yesterday. So Robert is down in Florida right now, right? Attending to, uh, to his grandfather. And we just want to uh, pray for him that God will continually heal him. Uh, we didn't pray for him during our time, right? All right, so why don't we do that right now, Jenny? Lord, we just want to pray for her grandfather-in-law, just praying that, Lord, you put your healing hands on him um, and just ask that you give him the strength to recover, be with Rob or her husband as she tra he travels down in order to be with his grandfather. And we ask that you bring out something positive from this situation. In your blessed name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you, Jenny. All right, next person that we want to invite up, she also uh, came in by profession of faith as well, Patricia Domer. Patty, come on up, come on up. Yeah, that was fun. Patty is so fun. Patty, Patty always has jokes and fun things to say. And so we appreciate you. God bless you. And this was for you over here. All right. Fantastic. And I don't see Kevin today. Tell him we miss him. He's sick. He's sick. Yeah. All right. No problem. We'll pray that he gets well. All right. I'm so glad that this person has come today. We've been looking forward to see this person and glad you're here. Bonnie Beamer. Bonnie Beamer, if you're in town, come on up, Bonnie. Come on up, Bonnie. Bonnie was so faithful during Summer Blast. She came every day, and she sat in the front, too. That was the thing that was cool. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Bonnie, we're so glad you're part of our church family, all right? And we want to be able to be able to see you and be able to journey with you, okay? This is for you. God bless you, all right? Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. all right. Good. So, and that's your mom, Charlotte, right? Charlotte, good to see you. Beautiful. Thank you, Bonnie. All right, we'll finish up quickly. All right, so next person that we would like. Oh, Amberly is not here today, huh? She's with Paul. All right, no problem. So tell Amberly to be here next time so that we can have it ready for her. And we'll be here. All right, next person. 
Uh, we appreciate, I appreciate this person a lot. Uh, the first time she came to Summer Blast, she said, Pastor Koja, I really love it, and I won't be able to get a ride during the week, but can you organize a ride for me, and I'll make sure I'm here every single time. She knows who she is already. Come on, Patricia. We're so glad that you got baptized, and uh, we're so glad you're a part of our church family, and we want you to continue journeying with us. We appreciate you. We love you. God bless you, all right? This is your Northwood Church family, as you already know. That's for you there. All right. Next person that we're going to invite up in order for that person to be able to receive their certificate as well. And this is the husband of Patricia. So come on up, Paul. God bless you, Paul. So glad you're a part of our church family, all right? And we pray that we continue to journey with you for the long haul, all right? God bless you over here. All right, thank you. God bless. All righty. Let's see. Oh, we got a few more. Got a few more who are not here right now. All righty. Okay. Now, this person is so, these people are fun. Uh, she comes every single Thursday and Saturday and whenever church is open and we enjoy seeing her and we enjoy journeying with her. And so come on up, Chrissy Quinlivan, and we would like to give you your certificate. All right. God bless you, Chrissy. We're praying for your back. We hope it gets better. All right. That is for you. God bless you. All right. Next person that's up is I call them the big three. They always love riding together. So it's Patty, it's Chrissy, and then it's Sandra. Come on up, Sandy. She already knew who she was. Come on up, Sandy. That's awesome. So glad you're part of our church family, all right? And God bless you. This is for you. All righty. Sounds good. Now, we have a few people like Mary, Don, they're recovering. They, uh, some of them had surgery and things of that nature. And so we're praying for their constant recovery and that God will continually help them and heal them. And they solicit the prayers of our church. So last thing to be able to say is that, yes, I'll take care of that. No worries. I'll take care of that at the end. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention that. So at the end, just come and see me. I'll make sure that there's a final signature on all of them for you guys. But let me tell you what it says on all of it. It says, in response to the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and in imitation of his example, blank's name was buried and raised with Christ through baptism on said date at Northwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so God bless each and every one of you. All right, moving forward. Next thing I want to talk to you about, do you have your bulletins on you? Can you take your bulletin for me, please? Love for you to take your bulletin over here. Got something to talk to you about. Okay, if you open it up to the middle where it says SDA News, I'd like for you to go down to the middle over there. And I want you to see something called Building for Eternity. I'm going to talk to you guys about what that is about a little bit, and then we'll take it from there. So really quickly, uh, this church that you're currently in is called Northwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now I'm going to do a quiz for you guys. How many Seventh-day Adventists do you believe are in the entire world. Anyone take a guess? A th thousands, okay. All right, that's not bad. That's not bad. Anybody else? Yes? 2,000, okay, all right. Let's get one more guess in there. Third one should be the charm. Uh, someone, said, someone said a million. All right, so the number is 22 million, okay? 22 million. So 22 million around the entire world. Now, the way it works is that you see this church over here, Northwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is just one out of so many Seventh-day Adventist churches, okay? So, Northwood Seventh-day Adventist Church, there are other Seventh-day Adventist churches in Ohio. When these Seventh-day Adventist churches come together, the ones in Ohio, they form a unit or they form a group called the Ohio Conference. Have you guys ever heard of that before? Some of you have, some of you haven't. So, it's called the Ohio Conference. 
And pretty much the Ohio Conference is what helps all of us at Seventh-day Adventists get together from time to time. So this Ohio Conference, the place where we typically get together for worship, for training, and for things of that nature, is a place called Camp Mohaven. It's a place called Camp Mohaven. Now, over here, Camp Mohaven is where kids can go for summer camps. It's where people can go for retreats. It's where we can go for worship with each other. We can go for workshops. All beautiful things happening in Camp Mohaven. Now, this place called Camp Mohaven, they are places uh, of worship. The problem is that the current place of worship is pretty, pretty small. And so our conference leaders have reached out to all the churches, and they wanted to share with the churches that they are building a new pavilion at Camp Mohaven. And so if you look over here in your bulletins, you'll see it. Uh, this pavilion over here can be able to fit about 1,500 people in there. And especially, uh, it's going to be helpful for our kids because it's going to be a gym so that they can go and they can play basketball and whatever other sports they want to play. So anyway, to build the entire building, they're reaching out to all the Seventh-day Adventists around the whole conference, and they're saying they would love different Seventh-day Adventists to contribute towards this goal. So there are three goals. The first goal is called the victory goal. And this goal allows them to build the building, acquire furnishing, like eight, and including HVAC, audiovisual, seating, and sports equipment. The second goal is four million. This goal helps to build a new RV park with parking pads and hookups and electrical and plumbing. And the big goal, the hallelujah goal, is five million. And the goal allows us to build new family-style cabins to increase occupancy for camp meetings, retreats, and other programs. And so the whole point is this, those numbers look big, two, three million, four million, five million. It looks big maybe for one person, but if all people are coming together in order to contribute to it, something like this can be totally attainable. So what's gonna happen is that at the end of the service, if you are so moved that you would like to help support this project, there's gonna be this sheet of paper that's gonna be made available to you. And with the sheet of paper, you can fill it out and you can make a pledge. You could say, hey, for the next three years, I would like to give $10 a month. I would like to give $20 a month in order to support this project so that all Seventh-day Adventist kids can be able to, in Ohio can be able to come to this place and participate and grow in Jesus, grow in God, and become better Christians. Once you do that, you can put that in an envelope. And once you put it in an envelope, what you can be able to do is that you can, whatever you can, you can just turn them in here to the church. And uh, what we will do is that we will put them together and send them to the conference. And so what we will do is that we'll probably give the entire month of December for you to be able to turn them in, or put them in a white envelope. You don't have to write your name on the outside of the envelope because you can write your name on this and then we'll be able to send it. So that's something that if you're interested in supporting, you are invited to do so. So it'll be made available to you. Wanted to share that. All right. I told you all, my sermon is short. I have quite a few things to say. And you know, I haven't been here since August 26th. And I'm not going to be back until December. So I got a few things to mention, and I'll get into my message. Here's the next thing I wanted to mention to everybody. So this is the other church that I take care of. It's called Toledo First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, and this church over here, uh, in a way, is what we call the mother church of Northwood, because Northwood was born out of this church. I think Ed can give me the statistic. Was it 1990, 1991? What was it, Ed? Right. 1950. Oh, you can't hear. Okay. 1950. Well, I'll get it from you later, Ed. I forgot when it was, but whenever it was, Northwood came out of Toledo first. So the basic point I want to make to everybody is that on the last Saturday of the year, the last Saturday of the year, pretty much Toledo first and Northwood, we are what we call a district, meaning that we um, partner with each other. We're sister churches, okay? We're sister churches. We're like family. And so as all of our leaders were talking, we came up with a suggestion. He said, you know what? It would be great if even though we're in, you know, somebody said it so beautifully one time. They said, we're all just one church. We're just in different locations. And so they said it would be beautiful if we can actually get together for one church service so that we from North and we from Toledo First can get to know each other a little bit better. And so with that being said, on the last Saturday of the year, we're going to have what we call a joint service with Toledo First Seventh-day Adventist Church. So what will happen is that we will close down the church for the day. So that's December 30th. We'll close down this church and all of us would go to Toledo first to worship that day. Yours truly will be there. So I'll be looking forward to seeing all of you and every one of you are invited to come. It's not that far from here, from this location. It's just 20 minutes. 
And so you're invited to be there uh, so that we can experience worship together. And so I wanted to mention that to you. Mark your calendar down. It's December 30th that this will be taking place. Everybody is welcome to come. I think, uh, Patricia, you've been to Toledo first, right? T Patricia's been there. Of course, Larry and Kevin and Shauna all know it and Matthew. Uh, anybody else who is new has been there before? Uh, okay. If not, then we welcome you all to come that day. Okay, I need to say something about this. Um, I know he's been introduced, but I want to also be able to formally introduce him to everybody that's here. Um, uh, what's it called? Around the top of October, right before I got married, uh, our church came together and they looked at me and said, Pastor Coach, you need some help. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Why don't we recruit a Bible worker? And so a Bible worker is a person who just kind of does what a pastor does. Uh, they go around, they pray for people, they visit them in their homes, and they preach and they teach from time to time. So anyway, Northwood here has our Bible worker, and our Bible worker is Mr. Matthew. So Matthew, why don't you stand up so everybody can see you? All right. You guys know Matthew over here? All right. Sounds good. And so don't be, I'm mentioning this because don't be surprised or shocked because Matthew has been visiting you in your homes already and he'll keep doing so. And so at, who, has, anybody, has he come to any of your homes yet already? Let me see by show of hands who's seen Matthew. Okay. Yeah. All right. You guys have seen Matthew. Yep. You all have seen Matthew. Excellent. And so Matthew will be doing that. Matthew also recently, I can announce it, right? Matthew also recently got married, by the way. And so uh, that is fantastic. And so uh, it, his wife is not here today, but uh, I think some of you have seen her before. And so anyway, beautiful. So that's good. Matthew, thank you for being a part of the team. Okay. Woo, I'm almost there. Last thing. I think it's the last thing. Yeah, almost the last thing. Okay, last thing on the announcement stuff, but then... Uh, get into some more spiritual stuff. I promise you, the sermon is not long, so I won't keep you. All right, last thing is that there's something, there's a document I'm going to give out to all of you at the end of our service called Let Your Wishes Come True in 2024. Let Your Wishes Come True in 2024. And what it simply is, is that it is a uh, document that you can indicate which places you wish to serve within our church within the year 2024. And so there's so many places that each and every person can get involved because one of the ways that everybody's Christian life grows is when we get involved. So check them out. Number one, let's say you want to wish, you wish to teach or help children. Children's Sabbath school, VBS, or even, I'm, I'm praying that one day we could start a children's choir. You know, you could, you could circle or check that you would love uh, to help out with that and we can be able to point you to our leaders. And then there's so much more. If you'd like to help with youth, give people Bible studies, look out for everyone's safety, help with audiovisual, help with our community programs, help with the physical needs of the church, help with fellowship meals. I don't want to read all of them. You see them. So I'll give that to you. You fill it out where you wish you would love to serve so that we can be able to get it to the appropriate leaders and we can also find a place for you to serve in our church family. So let your wishes come true in 2024 by finding a place to serve in God's church. And so that's this document that we're going to give you over here. Uh, you'll see it. Then on the back of this document, this is where you can circle where you would like to help out for the winter blast. And so you can circle food team, music team, whatever. And before you leave today, just turn it into me so that I can be able to have it. We'll reach out to you so that we can get you involved. Let your wishes come true. Find a place to serve, and we would love to be able to do that. All right, let's move on. So today we're going to have something called a foot washing service. Has anyone ever experienced this before? Has anyone not experienced this before? Sorry, not experienced it. All right, perfect. Then I want to quickly talk. I don't want y'all to look and say, I don't want to touch nobody's feet. I don't want nobody touching my feet. You know, we don't want to have all that discussion. So let's talk about it real, real fast so you can see what we're talking about. What's a foot washing service? It comes from the Bible. It comes from Jesus. John chapter 13, verses 2 to 5. This is right before Jesus died, and right before he did, um, he was having a meal with his followers. These followers are what we call disciples. I want you to look at it. It says, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Can you believe that? You're sitting with the person that's going to turn you in. Now, look at what the Bible says. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, I want you to see something, everybody. Look at verse 4. Look at what the Bible says in John 13, verse 4. So he, that is Jesus, got up from the meal, 
took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. What you have to understand is that in Jesus' time, people didn't wear closed toe shoes like how we're wearing them. They wore sandals. And they wore sandals in very dusty places. So when they got to a house, their feet were very what, everybody? Dirty. Now, the way they ate in Jesus, they didn't sit in no table like this and enjoy themselves like that. They did what we call reclining. So everybody would sit with their legs kind of out like this. And this is how they would eat their meals. And so as you're trying to eat, you could just imagine dust flying into your nose and into your face and into your food. So your feet need to get what, everybody? Wash. But the thing is that the person who washes feet is a slave. That's a slave's job. It was a slave's job in Jesus' time to wash people's feet. So all the disciples looking at each other like, I ain't no slave. I ain't no slave. Everybody with me? I ain't no slave, so I ain't washing your feet. So look at what Jesus does in verse 4. Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, God himself, he gets up from the meal. He takes off his outer clothing. He wraps a towel around his waist. And look at what he does. After that, he pours water into a basin, and he begins to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around. Is everyone seeing that? Can you imagine? Jesus, the God of the universe, does a slave's job. Does a slave's job. Now, look at what Jesus says. Verse 12. It says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Look at what he says. You also should wash one another's feet. Is everyone seeing that? So this example comes from Jesus. The example comes from Jesus to show that in the Christian community, the number one characteristic that should be demonstrated by all of us is the characteristic of humility. Is everyone following with that? And this humility is most powerfully displayed as we stoop down low and wash each other's feet. You know, it's powerful because as you wash someone else's feet, it does something to your own heart. It does something to your own anger, your own pride, your own bitterness, your own unforgiveness. It's a cleansing exercise. And by God's grace, we're all going to be able to participate in this today. Then right after we do so, notice the Bible says that Jesus, notice the Bible says that Jesus was doing this while they were eating a meal. Well, what meal were they eating? They were eating what we call the communion meal. Now, who has never participated in communion before? Has never done it. Okay, all right. Only one person. So almost everyone here is participating in communion. All right, great. So where does communion, what is communion all about? Communion is all about Jesus, focusing on him. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26. It said, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, and when he had given thanks, he broke bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you're going to see over here, there's going to be some bread. It's not going to be as big as the pieces that Jesus was eating. It's going to be sizable enough for all of us. Right? This is not your bread to get full. So don't be taking 10 and 12, all right? Just take one, all right? This ain't your, you know, when I do come here, sometimes some people take a six. I'm like, it's all right. You, know, you, don't, you ain't going to get full off the bread. Anyway, uh, but the point I'm trying to make, though, is that it's a serious matter because we get the opportunity to reflect on the death of Jesus, to focus on him. And he says that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this when, when you drink it. And look at the key phrase. It comes up two times. It comes up at the end of verse 24. Check it out. It says, in remembrance of me. Look at here again. In remembrance of me. The key point is this. Day to day, we forget about Jesus. Tell me I'm lying, everybody. Things make us forget about Jesus. Sometimes we're in church and we lose sight of Jesus. We're home, we lose sight of Jesus. And what the communion does is that it gives us a chance to refocus on him. All right, beautiful. So I think I've said everything I've wanted to say. And I just time me, 12.15. I'm done with our message so that we can get 
uh, into our communion time. That's the time I want to spend more time in that today. So my message today is called A Different Kind of Gratitude. So why don't we bow our heads and pray? And just in 10 minutes, we're going to share this word, and uh, we're going to close. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for blessing us today with uh, all positive and good things. And we just ask that as you, uh, we talk about gratitude, that it's a message that resonates with our hearts. In your precious name we ask and pray. Amen. So what does the world teach us about gratitude? What does the culture teach us about gratitude? Well, simply put, the culture teaches us this about gratitude. The culture teaches us that for every good thing, we give thanks. So, for example, uh, let me see if I got one child who is still awake. Any child still awake over here? Let's see. I got one. All right, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, come, don't be afraid. Come on up. So I got something here. I don't know if it's in my pocket still. Well, maybe it's not in my pocket. Uh, if it's not in my pocket. Oh, I still I got it in my pocket. All right, sounds good. So I'm going to pull out something in my, from my pocket. And if... And, I, and when I pull out my pocket, you tell me if this is a good thing, all right? You ready? Are you sure? I'm going to pull it out. You tell me if it's a good thing. On the count of three, two, one. Check what I got here. Is this a good thing? Yeah. Oh, she said yes. Okay. <laughs> I know that's right. Now, why is it a good thing? Because it's a dollar. So she could do a lot of things with a dollar, right? What, what can you do with a dollar? You can buy stuff, all right? Sounds good. So what if you had this dollar, what would you buy? Wow, you buy your baby brother some new shoes. That is beautiful. Well, I don't think a dollar can afford the new shoes, but it will get you close to that, all right? So what I'm going to do, because you were so bold and brave to come up, I'm going to give you this dollar, all right? Now, when I give you this dollar, what does she say? All right, sounds good. Excellent. She says, thank you. Good job. Take a seat. Now, notice... I think the illustration made its point clearly. We're taught from a young age that any time we receive a good thing, we're supposed to say what, everybody? Thank you. But today, the Bible wants to challenge us with a different kind of gratitude, my sermon topic. And notice what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. It doesn't say, for every good thing, give thanks. Instead, it says, in what, everybody? In everything. Oh, okay. Are you all tracking with me today? So it doesn't just say, in every good thing, give thanks. It says, in everything, give thanks. It's a different kind of gratitude. And why is it a different kind of gratitude? It's a different kind of gratitude because it's saying that whether it is a good situation or whether it is a negative situation, Christ is still calling us to display an attitude of gratitude. Are you with me today, everybody? Let's talk about it a little bit. What does this mean? First and foremost, it means that our gratitude should not be based on changing circumstances. Instead, our gratitude should be based on unchanging facts. Say that one more time. Our gratitude should not be based on changing circumstances. In other words, sometimes when our health situation changes, then we become grateful. When our financial situation changes, then we become grateful. When our school situation changes, then we become grateful. When our work situation changes, then we become grateful. That's the old kind of gratitude, the gratitude that the culture teaches us. What the Bible is saying here is saying that despite your work situation not being the way you want it to, God is still saying, find a way to be grateful. Despite your financial situation not working the way you want it to, still find a way to be grateful. Despite your health situation not working out the way you want it to, still find a way to be grateful. Why? You can be grateful not because of the changing circumstances, but you can be grateful because of the unchanging facts. Kojo, what are those unchanging facts? Hey, even if your finances and your are in the trash, the 
unchanging fact is that God still loves you. And for that, you can be grateful. Even if your health is not working out the way you want it to, the unchanging fact is that God still gives his grace to you. And for that, you can be grateful. Even if your work situation ain't working out the way you need it to, the unchanging fact is that God still gives mercy to you. And for that, you can be grateful. Even if all of your habits are not improving the way you want it to. The unchanging fact is that God is still patient with you. And so for that, you can be grateful. Even if your relationships are not working out the way you want it to, the unchanging fact is that God can still redeem you. And for that, you can be grateful. Don't allow your gratitude to be based on the changing circumstances but allow your gratitude to come from the unchanging facts. And the unchanging fact is that God still loves you. He still cares for you. He still looks out for you. He still calls you by your right name. And if you remember those unchanging facts, gratitude can still come up in your heart. Are we hearing the word of God today, everybody? Amen, indeed. So if this is what it means, to give thanks in everything. The second thing it means is that it means that in every situation, you can always find something to be grateful for. Tell me I'm lying, everybody. You can always find something to be grateful for. Matter of fact, it leads me to my next question. Why can we give thanks in everything? And here it is. The first reason why we can give thanks in everything is because what I've learned in life is that there is a blessing in every burden. Say it again. We can give thanks in everything because what I've learned in life is that there is a blessing in every what everybody burden. And so your health challenge may feel like there's a burden. But what I'm here today to say to you is that in the burden, there is a blessing. So don't count the burdens, count your blessings. You see, I'm here to say is that even in your family squabbles, it may feel like a burden. But even in the burden, there is a blessing. So despite the family squabbles, don't count the burdens. Instead, count the what, everybody? Blessings. And if you realize that there is a blessing in every burden, it gives you the strength to give thanks in every circumstance. One person one time said, they said this, they said, they said it, it was such a beautiful, beautiful quotation that they gave. And it was a quotation about gratitude. And what they simply said is that if you look out for things to be grateful for, you will find out there's something to be grateful for in everything. If you look out for things to be grateful for, you will find out there's something to be grateful for in everything. Not only should we be grateful because there's a blessing in every burden, but we should also be grateful because God protects us not only from the dangers that we see, but he protects us from the dangers that we don't see. Are you all hearing me today, somebody? I, 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 I talking about the dangers that we don't see. I'll never forget when I was a child, I was growing up in a country called Uganda, and that's where my parents were living as missionaries. And so one night, there were these ants that lived in the area, and these ants were called safari ants. I don't know if anybody ever had seen safari ants before. They're black ants with a silver shiny back. And when they move, they move like a unit. Like, ooh, that's how they move. And those are the type of ants, when they bite you, you bleed. You see the blood flowing. I mean, I ain't never seen them. And they small little ants, too. But them ants are, are fiery. And so I remember one night, talking about God protecting us from the dangers that we can't even see. One night, those ants had a brilliant idea. They decided to invade our entire house, literally. I mean, they filled up every place, every single wall, the bathrooms, every single where. Here's the point I want to make. Throughout the entire time that they were invading the house, myself, my brother, and my sister, we were completely unaware of what was taking place. All that simply happened is that we woke up in the morning, and all we did is that we looked around us, and we just saw dead ants all over the wall. Dead ants all over, literally. Can you imagine waking up to that? All we saw, dead black ants all over the wall. So we rushed out to my parents and we said, mom, dad, what, 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 what were you guys trying to do, a new decoration in our room? And they, and they looked at us and they said, no, during the night, the ants came in 
And for some reason, we woke up. And while you were sleeping, you couldn't see the danger that was around you. But thank God we were awake to take care of the situation so that you guys didn't wake up to a more terrible situation on your hands. And can I say this is how God deals with us in our lives. There are dangers all around us every single day that we are not even aware of. We don't even know the person that's plotting against us. We don't even know what's going to happen to us the next second. We don't even understand what's happening the next minute. We don't even know what disasters may be coming our way. But day in and day out, while we're sleeping, while we're unaware, while we don't know, God is protecting us and keeping us from all of those dangers. And so for me, when I sit down and reflect, I can always say, God, I just want to give you thanks because there are things that you protected me of that I can't even see. Are we hearing the word of God today, everybody? You can always give thanks. Okay, I'm past my time, y'all. Give me five more. I'm almost there. I'm giving five more. I'm filling the sermon. I'm filling the sermon. Give me five more. Give me five more. Almost done. Why can we give thanks? Not only because there's a blessing in every burden, but because he protects us not only from the dangers that we see, but the dangers that we don't see. Let me give you the last one. We can also give thanks because what the devil intended is not what God allowed. All right. Say it all. We can give thanks because what the devil intended is not what God allowed. You see, I remember one time I got into a really bad accident in Chicago. God came, hit me in the back of the car, and ran away. You know, I sit back in that situation. I say, perhaps the devil intended for me to die that day, but God only allowed for the car to get wrecked that day. Is everyone hearing me? You see, we're, it, it, come on, y'all. Y'all know these situations. Some of you, you were so sick, you didn't think you were going to make it out the hospital. You see, what the devil intended was for your life to be over. But you came out that hospital stronger than before. So what God allowed was just some minor bruises to your bones and to your body. What the devil intended and what God allowed were different. And because of that, we can always give thanks. Sometimes what the devil intended was for you to be totally knocked out due to your depression. But what God allowed was for you to recover from it. There is what the devil intended and what God allowed. And I'm so glad that even though the devil intends evil towards me, God has a way of working out everything he tries to plan for evil into his ultimate good. And because of that, I can sit back and say, God, I give you thanks. And ultimately speaking, why should we always have an attitude of gratitude? Well, simply put, we should have an attitude of gratitude simply because I've learned in life that a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't get anywhere with it. Come on, somebody. And it's the same thing in our lives. If we got bad attitudes... You ain't going nowhere with it. Talk to me, somebody. You know that already. The people who got bad attitudes in work, they, the only place they're going to end up going is that they end up getting fired. Talk to me, somebody. Well, they should get fired. That's what should be happening. Come on, y'all. Y'all hearing me today, right? You got a bad attitude in the home. It ain't going to take your family anywhere. You got a bad attitude in your marriage. It ain't going to take your marriage anywhere. You got a bad attitude about your schoolwork. It ain't going to take your schoolwork anywhere. Got a bad attitude about everyone you deal with in life. You're never going to be happy. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. Can't take you anywhere. And so what helps to fix a bad attitude is to replace a bad attitude with a different kind of gratitude everyone hear me today. But the last reason why we should always give thanks in everything is because by giving thanks in everything, it gives us a healthy perspective. It gives us a healthy perspective. You know, in life, perspective is everything. What eyes do you look through life with? Do you look through life with God's eyes? Or do you look through life with your eyes? Let me tell you something. When you look through life with your eyes, when every problem comes, you will say, God, look how big my problem is. Every time. But when you look through life through God's eyes, 
When any problem comes, you will say, problem, look how big my God is. Are you hearing that, everybody? And the way to develop, and, 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 what, and, what, and what gratitude does for us is that gratitude helps us not look through life simply through human eyes, as my friend Ed will say sometimes, but he helps us look through life with God's eyes so that we go through it with the right perspective. And the right perspective can give you hope in replacement of despair, encouragement in replacement of discouragement because you've got the right perspective. My question to you is, how do you develop this kind of gratitude? You got your Bibles on you? Turn it. Go to First Test 5. That'll give you the answer. That's my time. It's 1220. I'm done. But I got to give you the answer. How do you develop an attitude of gratitude? How do you do it? Look at First Thessalonians, where our text is. Where our text is. I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is right there. First Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. We got to do communion. I got to finish. First Thessalonians 5. Look at it, everybody. Look at it. Verse, 18, verse 17 and 18 says, or 18, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. But how, how, because this is hard. So how do we develop this? Look at verse 23. Look at it, everybody. That's the answer. It's right here, 23 and 24. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at it. It closes. Verse 24. He who calls you is faithful and he also will do it. We can't develop an attitude of gratitude by ourselves. We need the power of Jesus to help us do it. And this power was made available when he died for us on the cross. And we celebrate this power today so he can give us the strength to be holy. And part of holiness is developing this different kind of gratitude. May God give it to all of us today. God bless each and every one of us. this moment, we get to do something so beautiful. We get to transition to our communion service so that we can reflect on the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you are, I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes with me so we can begin in prayer. Lord, I'd like to just say thank you. Thank you for being a kind, a good, a great, and awesome God. And more importantly, we thank you for Jesus, whom he didn't have to, but he got on the cross and he died in order to give us a chance that we may live. And as we celebrate this moment, this time, this opportunity, my prayer is that we will be deeply impressed with his sacrifice so that it could be meaningful in our lives. In your precious name we ask and pray. Amen. I'm going to read a Bible verse. And it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And uh, Matthew, I'm going to ask you to pick up a microphone. Yes. And this is what the Bible says. It says, Hebrews 12, verse 2, we must look unto Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, and he despised the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to open up to everyone who is here. And we've all heard about the sacrifice of Jesus. We've read it. We've listened to sermons on it. We've watched movies on it. And I want to open up the floor and the opportunity for you to reflect and talk back to me. The question I have for you today is, what about the cross of Jesus touches your heart the most? What about the death of Jesus touches your heart the most? The floor is open. Please feel free to share. I'm grateful. Okay grateful. So when Chrissy thinks about the cross, 
she thinks gratitude. If there's anyone else, Matthew will come to you with the microphone so you can be heard. We have one over there. I think it was Paul. I'm not much on speaking, but I'm, if it weren't for him, we'd, we'd have nothing at all. Hmm. And there'd be nothing at all. And I'm, I'm grateful every day to even be able to wake up and see that we have another day. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else? What about the cross of Jesus touches your heart the most? The death of Jesus. What about it touches your heart the most? Oh, Sue. We have Sue on this side. That's how much he suffered for us. Mm. How much he suffered for us. The pain and suffering he went through for us to mm -hmm. be saved. And you know what, Sue? The Bible says it is by his wounds that pain and suffering that we are healed. Yes, yeah. Anybody else? We'll take maybe two more. I have Rhonda on this side. Then we have Linda. Not just the, I guess it did turn into physical suffering. Not just the physical suffering. He was not ready at the time. Hmm. He said, if not now, when to his mother, she was not ready as a mom, seeing that her son was what his fate was going to be. Mm -hmm. He was not ready, and just the emotional suffering leaving his mother, but he also knew it's what his father wanted, and you know, the greater good mm. for all of us. Exactly. So he had all the wounds on the cross, but he also, in his heart, loved his mother. and His mother, yeah. You know, and it's so true, because one person says that we underrate, we talk so much about the physical suffering of Christ. But there was so much mental and emotional suffering as well. And all we could sit back and do is say, God, thank you for doing it for us. We have Linda all the way on this side. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you didn't get a workout all week, Matthew, this is it. I, one thing that comes to mind is everyone needs to think of it as very very personal mm. it's all the suffering that he had gone through the beatings the demeaning things being spit on and things thrown at him and it it isn't just the physical part it's how it tore his heart and that when you think about it think about it as it was all done just for you as an individual and that he is always there just for you as an individual Amen. and that the feeling of knowing that he is there, that he went through all of this for you so you could have eternal life is something that can give you peace in anything. So hang on to it. You know, Linda, there was a, we always like this verse, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And when you talk about personalizing, I'll never forget what someone told me. Don't just say God so loved the world. But you can also say God so loved me. That he right. gave his one and only son. Mm -hmm. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jermaine, then we'll come over here to I can't remember if it was here or something I was watching, but they um, put the weight of sin in perspective. When he was on the cross and he felt so disconnected that he says, my God, my God, where have you forsaken me? Mm. 
And I can't remember the commentary, someone was saying that God did not forsake Jesus, but it was because he, at that time, he was bearing all our sins, mm. our past, our present, and our future sin. And then it put into perspective how sin disconnects you from the Father, and he was feeling that on the cross. Mm. And then someone also put in perspective that at that point in time, he could have said, forget this. Mm. At that point in time, he could have called on all the angels because mm. they were mocking him. Mm -hmm. Like, you save so many, why don't you save yourself? Mm. And to put it in perspective, I know if it was me, I would, maybe I would have like, yep, yeah, forget it. Mm. Come and save me. I'm done. But he bore it. He stood there. He stayed there. He bore our sins. And knowing that the... The option out was right there. It was the easiest thing to do. It's, that was the hardest part, to bear mm -hmm. the sin, to die for us. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are not worthy of it. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing to do was to say, Be quick. all right, come on, angels, take me off this cross. Mm -hmm. But he bore it for us. He died for us. So, yeah, that's the most touching aspect of the cross. Exactly. You know, it would be one thing if he had no escape route. But he had it, and he still chose not to take it. Amen. We got a hand here. I got my exercise for the week, y'all. <laughs> yes, I am so grateful for the ultimate sacrifice, mm. the blood, sweat, and tears, and the mercy he had for us mm. and our Father God, for us sinners. Mm. And it's a shame that there were so many people doubt and didn't, didn't understand or see it or believe. Mm. But, and to come back, to give us a second chance. Mm. Um, if I was there at that time, I don't know if I would have felt this way. Mm. I mean, I've always had, you know, I believe in God and I believe in Christ, but more so than ever. And uh, there's, there's no comparison to you know what he did for us exactly. so if we don't open up our eyes there's no more chances mm. so i'm thankful and blessed amen mm -hmm. amen thank you so much beautiful well at this time i would love to ask both sean and barb to come we're going to uncover the communion emblem I love the exercise that we just did. There's a, sometimes you may hear her name said in this church, and one day I'll explain it in further detail. There's a lady called Ellen White, whom we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that God gave her what we call a gift of prophecy. Prophecy is the gift where you share spiritual messages from God. A prophet's message must always align with the message of the Bible. And Ellen White wrote several books. They actually said she's written over 25 million words and wrote a book called Desire of Ages. It is literally the best book on the life of Jesus Christ outside of the Bible. And in this book, she says, if we are to spend one thoughtful hour, even just a day, even just a week, taking into mind the closing scenes of Christ's life, she says, our love for him will be strengthened and quickened every single day. This exercise we just did together, do it privately and watch your love for Christ continually grow as you reflect on what he has done for each and every one of you. I'd love to call uh, Kevin and Matthew at this time. And as we do, we uncover the emblems here. And in the emblems, first, you will see this bread that's packaged here. And you also see the juice that's packaged here as well. And so they'll come around. And as they come around, you take one of the juices, you take one of the breasts. So one can start here. Right?
Thank you. All right. Has everyone been served? All right. Let's read this passage together before we continue. It says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We may eat the bread at this time. Amen. Continuing on the count of three. One, two, three. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink the juice. final verse, verse 27, it's not on the screen, but I'll read in your hearing, and this is how it concludes. The Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, or verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to go through this op uh, service where hearts and minds are deliberately focused on you. I pray that this will only be a one-time moment or a one-time event, but it will be a continual occurrence in our lives. In your precious name, we ask and pray. At this moment, Matthew and Kevin are coming around to collect items for you. Every 
dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus